Hi, and welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast, where we talk about all things flute. If you're looking for more tips or lessons with from Emily, please check out Musigy.com for all the sheet music, transcriptions, albums, books, and flute lesson packages. That's Musigy.com. M-U-S-O-G-Y.com. Also, if you're looking for posters, fingering charts, or merch, you can head over at our merch store at store.thefluechannel.com for all your flute needs. If you want to help us on a monthly basis, you can also consider joining us over at Patreon for as little as $2 a month. This helps us make more great content for you. Check the description for more info. Finally, if you're looking into buying a flute, please consider using the Flute Center of New York and use our code TFC for a 10-day trial in trying three flutes. Check the description for all the details. Now on with the show. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Emily. How's it going, Emily? I'm good. How are you? Good. This is the podcast that we talk uh, to all of you live over on YouTube. And uh, if you're listening after, uh, come and join us at the last Sunday of every month. And also go leave us a five-star review at uh, Apple Podcasts or leave us a five-star review uh, over at Spotify, any of those things. But you can also leave a comment over at Apple Podcasts. And I have one here, one five-star review. We're going to try to say one every single time. We're going to start uh, putting that into this into this rotation. <laughs> Uh, this five star review says absolutely amazing uh, by artsy person she's in the US uh, if you play the flute or piccolo this podcast is, is the one for you you can ask uh, whatever question you like to very entertaining I always look forward to it they always have answered my questions and give a good clear answer I'm so glad they are doing this podcast thanks so much yeah artsy thank person. you so much yeah so today so yeah, you can just leave a review that like that, and we'll try to uh, find them. And it can be anywhere in the world where you can find them on Apple Podcasts, and that's uh, that. Uh, but today we're going to talk about flute solo pieces, and then we're going to jump into some of your questions about whatever you like flute-related at the second half of the show. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that, because we, uh, I think we did listen to a solo piece at the... Uh, concert of Bob Aiken to go roll back to the other episode of the podcast. I think there was one piece that was solo flute. Was there? Yes, there was. There was that uh, one guy who played by himself. I forget the piece, though, now. But it was a flute solo piece. I think it was Schmullet Ran. No, it was... There uh, was one that was with the Wild tape, Shaman. and then there was... I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't have the program, uh, program yeah. in front of me. But it was a... There was a couple of those like that, and it was really cool. So I had in mind that we both talk about um, some flute solo pieces that we like a lot that we you give to your students and stuff like that and also to perform. So if you want to start or I can start, uh, it's all cool. Like, oh, you, you can, can start. You can yeah. start. Cool. So like, you know, there's a, um, I have three of various degrees, you know, like uh, the first one is Bob Aiken's Icicle and or Bob Aiken's Plain Song. Those are both very nice beginner intro of contemporary, but very approachable. And you can find that music anywhere online. It's readily available. So Icicle, like the like ice, you know, Icicle. So you don't get confused if it's written differently or anything like that. And it's very beautiful. I like it. Yeah, very it's very cute. And it's very like flowing and very melodic. And there's a lot of nice little things in there. Yeah, it sounds good. And it's uh, like you said, it's approachable. It's yeah, like yeah. You have those um, contemporary effects that are not hard to do, I feel. 100%. Piece, so totally. Exactly. Cool. And then I have... Um, Another one, which is a bit, they're all in the contemporary. Like, there are a lot of, there are a couple Baroque things as well, but, you know, you can find those. There's like a Bach lot of Baroque. And, uh, CPE Bach. There's a lot of stuff like that. But these ones are very cool because they're sort of modern a little bit. They have a little bit of the, you know, current day type of uh, writing. And then we have, like, I think, you know, uh, the Piazzolla Etudes. Piazzolla wrote six Etudes that are really, really cool for solo flute that have so much rhythm and are fun to play with. And there's loads of recordings everywhere. And you can, you can do one, and they're all performance pieces, so you can put them in, and you can change it up and add, like, I know some people, they add, like, little click sounds, and with their mouths, they do weird stuff. They try to add percussion underneath with themselves, and mm -hmm. it's very creative. You can um, you can play that in concert. Yeah, they're not totally. etudes, etudes, like, they're really... Concert etudes. Concert etudes, yeah. the same way as uh, Chopin's etudes for piano can oh, yeah. totally be played in a concert, like, it's real pieces. You're I so would right. say those Piazzolla etudes are the same. Yeah, they're yeah, real yeah. pieces. They're real pieces, yeah. for sure. And then finally, um, another one is very contemporary. That was Density 21.5. That's a, a, a big staple in the contemporary world. It's a little harder, but it's also uh, it's also fun as well, too. It's by Varese. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't uh, have that many um, contemporary effects, though. No, it doesn't. Uh, but it has a contemporary flair still. You know, it's very unique because in it's, that way. Yeah, it's 
because it's a tonal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, it's a it, quite a cool piece. He chooses intervals that doesn't make, don't make you find a um, tonic. You yeah, know? exactly. And yeah. but it still flows, which is yeah. amazing. Like he follows this the same. He follows principles, though that it, there is a beginning, middle, and end. Still, you know, it's kind of funny in that way. It has yeah. that type of thing. So oh that's yeah, cool. and you can remember the melody of it. Yeah, like it's yeah. Yeah, and he's a he was a, a conductor as well for classical music as well. He was a big conductor in New York City. Conducted all Beethoven's everything, you know, and he was really infatuated with, you know, uh, contemporary music as well. And when he wrote this, he wrote this for a flutist, George Barrere, who had the first ever platinum flute. So it was written, he wrote it in mind of this flute that was built because density 21.5 is the density of platinum. So it's the, the density of that metal as opposed to sterling silver. It has a lower density level. I don't remember. It's like 19.5. I don't remember the numbers exactly. But platinum is 21.5. So that's uh, really kind of the story behind it. And so uh, maybe he envisioned uh, the metal ringing more because platinum rings more to some people and stuff like that. So those are my three. That's cool. Yeah. They're all a little bit of that side. Yeah. In, uh, in, in solo flute, I noticed there's a lot of, Baroque music, like you have Bois Mortier, who composed uh, suites for solo flute. Mm -hmm. You have Telemann's Fantasies. You have Marais Marais, uh, Folie d'Espagne. Yeah, Les Folies d'Espagne, that's how you say it. Do you say it in English? Is there an English title for Marais Marais? Uh? No. no. Uh, well, there Les might Folies be, but, but uh, you can, people it's will find it. It's very yeah. beautiful. Um, you know, there's C.P.E. Bach, which is like, kind of between baroque and classical i guess but there's also back like there's so much in baroque music and then mm -hmm. there's so much in contempt like 20th century music and 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 21st century music yeah but those tend to be a lot but more harder though i was you know. noticing in the middle mm -hmm. not much huh classical period romantic period mm -hmm. romantic none i don't know well, there might be some but it's it, those are not there's heavy like periods of the Burm's flute caprice i would say maybe that some of them could be played in a concert. Mm -hmm. Car Gellert. Car Gellert is late uh, romantic, I think. Yeah. Some some etudes, maybe, but yeah. Anderson, what's his... Uh, well, Anderson was... Uh, 19th 18th, like Yeah, 19th century. Yeah. Yeah. He was so, soon after. But like, he was also... Yeah. It's still etudes. Like, I'm not sure I would play them in concert, right. most of them. Yeah, Don Yon made some. You know, like there's uh, the Donyon, like, like the nice pieces. You know, it's mostly Levant Baroque or whatever. Yeah, there's like the the wind of something. It's called like the okay. wind of something. I can't remember exactly. Oh, I don't know that one. I think it's Donyon, but I'm not sure. How do you write that? Thing? Also, there's I can't remember. I have I have it somewhere, but there's also uh, the the three pieces by Ferrer, uh, Trois Pièces uh, de Bre. No, it's like. Beru? Ferru, yeah, Ferru, sorry, Ferru. But he wrote three pieces for flute. Isn't it twentieth century that? Yeah, it is twentieth century. I'm not talking about the which oh, period. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying another pieces that in my way. Yeah, yeah. So then, when you get that. to twentieth century, you have oh, like right. Ferru's three pieces. You have Syrinx. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like they're pretty much the same period, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, a lot of contemporary stuff. Yeah, that's super cool too. Mm. What do you yeah. like to give to? What do you like to give to your students first? Like, what are one or two pieces that you always like to give, or maybe there's some that they recommend. They even say, "Oh, what about this?" I like this? Telemann's Fantasies a lot because, mm -hmm. like, in like a two-page piece, you have four movements mm -hmm. that are contrasting, and I feel it's fun because you can work on slow movements, fast movements, like more technical things. You can work. You can talk about baroque um, interpretation. You know how to do the trills. Um, how to add little ornaments yeah. and stuff like that. I like that. Yeah, and those are the Telemann uh, fantasy, fantasies or fantasias. The, a lot of ways it's written for solo flute there are 12. So you can find those anywhere for free almost. Uh, IMSLP yeah. has it, which is a website, imslp.org. And uh, yeah. yeah. The only thing is when you get those um, those editions, if they're earth text, there's no... There's no um, slurs written in. There's not much written in because back then composers didn't mm -hmm. write as much. So um, the musicians were mm -hmm. supposed to add their own 
slurs, mm -hmm. some ornaments and stuff like that. That's why right now I'm working on them to record them. And I'm probably uh -huh. going to make my own edition to help people who uh, are a bit lost in all that. Like, right. where do I put my slurs? Mm -hmm. So it can give them a ideas you don't yeah. have to do what i wrote exactly. but at least it gives you kind of a beginning uh point mm -hmm. in your interpretation mm -hmm. totally so that's pretty cool but yeah it's it's very accessible exactly and like we're talking about flute solo pieces today so like i know there's a lot of also flute solos in orchestra repertoire but i know we're gonna jump into an episode like that coming yeah but up they're soon not too. solo flute they're, they're, they're not solo solos. solo yeah so, see? We're so it's like yeah solo, solo flute. flute yeah <laughs> it's so funny how people think like yeah the algorithm doesn't know you know i think in bob Aitken, bob Aitken's book yeah there's a whole program that he shows that he was doing in that year mm -hmm. of solo flute yeah and it's pretty cool because he puts like Marais Marais, mm -hmm. more Baroque, and then also a lot of contemporary mm -hmm. stuff, and he mixes it up mm -hmm. around. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And like, what do you think is the one piece that everybody always wants to play that's for solo flute? I would say probably Syrinx yeah. is the most known and the most... Uh, that's yeah. by Debussy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Syrinx by Debussy. Exactly. That's a big famous one. And it's, uh, you can also find that readily for free in, if, you, if you can't oh, afford yeah. to buy it. Like it's, uh, it's in it's the public domain. So in flute tunes. Flute tunes has it. Flute Everybody tunes has com. it. You have a lot of flute music. Yeah. IMSLP, I think, has it as yeah. well. And there's different editions, like I said. Because originally it was actually for a stage play, I guess. And it was music to be played as a sort of an effect on stage in the background. It's supposed to be played off stage as like a sort of an echo and stuff like that. So yeah. it's kind of interesting. And there's also words to it, too. I know somebody who performed it with the words of the player. They found something that was relatable to it. So... There was actually spoken with a word story. over, it. yeah, with a story and stuff. It's very interesting. So there's a lot of creativity in that, and that's pretty cool as well too. So, but to go back, you said about urtex. I know a lot of people might not know what urtex means, and urtex is a, is a what? Uh, urtex means it's the real text, the original text. That's close, yeah. That yeah. the composer wrote, right? Because like a lot of editions have add-ons by the editor mm -hmm. so if i edit a piece a baroque piece i can add dynamics right. i can add mm -hmm. um slurs and uh, artic different articulations and some things like that but then it's difficult for an, uh, a musician who interprets that like who performs it to be like um, what did the composer choose and what did right. the editor choose? Because yeah, maybe exactly. I don't want those slurs, maybe I want other totally. slurs. So mm -hmm. earth text kind of comes in and tells you, like, that's what we think only the composer wrote. Mm -hmm. Nothing, we didn't add anything. Right, exactly. That's a nice clear definition of it, for sure. Yeah. So they like, don't get confused when we say earth text and even, like, uh, I don't know what other things, other ways they say those things, but, like, earth text is really the one that everybody uses. And there's even a company that uses or text the word a lot in their books like you know there's a bar you know like there's Baron a lot of writer baron and ranker and all those <laughs> things so uh be sure to look out for all those pieces oh those pieces are quite fun there's even more in higher difficulty level and lower difficulty level but those are all various ones from different difficulty levels so you can approach them and start looking into the whole world of what solo flute is yeah. and then like, you can also transcribe like uh Let's say you want to do uh, Paganini's Caprice. You right. can transcribe from them. Other, from or other use someone else's transcription. Yeah, right. exactly. You could play, if you want, you could play a cello uh, suites by Bach, you yep. know? Exactly. Totally exactly. possible thing to do. Totally. So yeah, this is about the halfway point of the show. So if you have any questions, leave them down in the chat. We'll answer all those. But I just want to kind of do a, a little bit of reminders of stuff that's coming up and stuff that we have available. Both uh, the beginning and intermediate book are out now. Uh, you can go to musogy.com, M-U-S-O-G-Y.com, and you can uh, go and download those courses and buy those courses. Uh, the beginner is 15 beginner flute lessons, and then the second book is 20 intermediate flute lessons. So those are, you know, both of them combined is a huge program to gradually get you to a good point at an intermediate level of playing flute to enjoy playing flute and all those types of things. And we've had tremendous success with that. And we're very happy with everybody who's had uh, the chance to do the courses and um, learn the flute with Emily here. And then we also have um, our regular merch store. Merch store is doing, going strong as usual, which is nice. And you can go and get uh, our flute fingering posters, uh, mugs, 
shirts, shirts uh, the leggings for yoga, whatever you want. The Mozart concerto leggings. Oh yeah, that's cool. Stuff like that. It's pretty cool. And um, what else? We have uh, Patreon. Patreon's going strong. We're going to start maybe doing a cool little different uh, series about watching movies and oh, reviewing yeah. uh, classical movies with the theme of classical music in or it music. or music yeah. and stuff like that so that's gonna be fun we have a poll there right now asking what we want to uh watch first and i think amadeus might be the first one i and almost know it by good. heart yeah i'll we'll have to <laughs> but you'll have to watch it <laughs> i like that so yeah you can go and join us over at patreon.com slash the flu channel and there you can donate as little as two dollars a month and that helps us go a long way to make more stuff and produce things and uh that really uh uh, helps us out a lot and summer's coming up soon so we're going to be out and about doing stuff so um that's about it there's a couple things just stay tuned about all of our ongoings over on instagram and uh, we'll try to do some posts also on the community page here on youtube so yeah i think that's about it what else is there that we have no lessons right now studio is going to be a little bit uh, on hiatus for the summer yeah. so uh, so we can go do our creative uh juices flowing and doing stuff out in the in the world because the world's coming back which is great and fun we're so, going um, in france for an artist residency so we'll create stuff there mm -hmm. this summer it's amazing yeah and you'll see all those things on yeah. uh, online so back to our questions here rodrigo vincent da silva he says hello and good morning yes good morning to you too rodrigo um can you recommend me a traverse flute in e-flat tuning at a reasonable cost for a beginning study E flat tuning, traverse flute. Okay, if you play a modern flute, it yeah. can play in any key. That's right. You don't need one for, like, if you play a flute, a flute like flute, mine, yeah. you you don't even bar baroque flutes. There's no different tuning flutes. There's no different versions. Mm, no. You can play all the semitones on a baroque. Oh, it's flute. true. It's true. It's true. It's only if you play like a bansuri or those oh, yeah. types of flutes, you need mm -hmm. one in E flat. You need one in C. But if you play a normal like. Can you answer us? Do you play uh, metal, Sil like silver, a silver like flute that's on our channel all the time? Like the flute that I play. And if so, like I know there used to be soprano flutes and different. I know there used to be one or two flutes, but I don't remember what keys they were made. I know they were not in C though. Like they were like tuned in a different. Like the fingerings are different. So if you play um, an E flat, it's it's like the other day one of my students. She plays in a band, like a wind band or an orchestra. Oh, yeah. And she had a part of piccolo written in D, D flat. flat for it. So it was all transposed. Right. So I transposed it back for her. Like <laughs> she sent me the music and I, wow. I wrote it down for her. So maybe that's that. Maybe it's like an old music you have that's for an instrument in E flat and you have to transpose it. Exactly. If it's the case, don't buy a new flute. Just transpose the whole thing. Yeah. If you don't know what transposing is, it's like mm -hmm. some <laughs> instruments, in order to not have to learn new fingerings every time you, you play, let's say the, baro the the alto flute, we say it's in G because when the alto flute plays a C, it sounds like a G. We do that so that we don't have, when we read a C, we still finger a C even though it sounds like a G. It's easier for the musicians. So if you take music written for an instrument that's transpository, like the alto flute, let's say, and you want to play it on a non-transpository instrument like the flute, which is in C, the normal C flute, yeah. then you have to transpose it. Right. So I would, maybe yeah. that's what's happening Exactly. There. And I would say like, you know, like recorders and stuff, I think Angie was saying here, I was going to mention that penny whistles and stuff like that, those are made in different keys yeah. and stuff like that. We have a, uh, but recorders, a whistle here in yes F, you know. But recorders, yes and no, because like... Not recorders, recorders uh, tin whistles yeah. and stuff like that. Yes, there's and like recorders several. are all not transpository. Like, let's say you play the soprano recorder. That's this right. is G, and then the alto. This is C. Mm -hmm. So you don't trans. Like you always play the real note. It's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's a different system. Exactly. Than for other instruments. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Do you have any other things that uh, you'd like to talk about while we're also just waiting for some more comments? And I know it's Sunday morning. It's always a, it's always a time to wake up oh, and get things going. Thing. Ah, here we go, Danny. Oh yeah, Danny was at the beginning of the show too, saying hello. That's great. Hi, Danny. When I play the third octave notes, uh, I use the bottom part of my left index finger as a fulcrum point. But after a while, the bottom part of my finger gets all red and indented. Any tips on how to avoid that? 
Oh, yeah. So maybe you're... This one here? Yeah. Maybe you're pushing too hard. Um, but that fulcrum point is not only when you use a third octave, it's all the time. Yeah, it's in constant it's movement it, there. Yeah, It's always being held. Yeah, it's not in yeah. movement. It's always there. Like, it's yeah. stable. That that point here on your finger at the base of the index, it's a fulcrum point that's one of the three fulcrum points. You have this one, you have the mouth, like the, the chin, and then you have your right thumb. Those are the three fulcrum points that hold your flute. Um, maybe you're pushing too hard, or maybe it's just uh, the angle. You have to figure out the right angle. Or sometimes I noticed if I put my flute right on that little vein there, it does that to me. So I try to put in a specific point. Or what you can do is uh, put little jelly things or there's uh, bebops. Bebops are like a thing you add on your flute. It's in plastic and it kind of guides your index finger. But it's hard. But I have a student who has one and she says it's helpful. And I know there's also little jelly things you can put on your flute to make it a bit softer. Ankara? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you can use those. You can use gels. You can use a lot of people. They just go and buy, uh, you know, the gels that you use for your feet. You, you can get those and put oh. at the store and put those on there. Uh, just make sure you put it on there because it's most likely going to be pretty much semi permanent. Like it's going to be hard to get off and stuff like that. So okay. there are special ones. I think the flute specialist, the flute specialist dot com, they have a lot of stuff like that, like uh, bebops things. For to make the flute more ergonomic for your hands and more comfortable for your yeah, hands. Thumb ports, bebops, all those things. Like yeah, exactly. Thumb ports, soft gels. There are gels called, I think, flute gels that they have as well that are similar to that. Um, sort of like, like you said, it has a little pillow for your for your side there to kind of give a little bit of a uh, tension release, I guess, or uh, that of that area. So you can go there, the flute specialist.com mm. has a lot of those things. And make sure that you don't. Push too hard because if you start having pain on your finger, mm -hmm. maybe it's because you push too hard and then you're going to have pain in your jaw if you push too hard on your jaw as yeah. well. Like it has to be stable. Mm -hmm. You have to push a little bit so that everything's stable, but don't overdo it and hurt yourself, you know? Yeah. And also sometimes it can, a thumb board can be, because if maybe if your flute is more stable with on your right thumb, mm -hmm. then you won't feel a need to push as hard with your left index finger, you know? Sure. It's a yeah. whole balance. Yeah, it's a whole balance thing. And, you know, it's just, yeah. And there are so many different ways to hold the flute because the flute's already a bit uneven. So, you know, try doing that as a baseline first and then see how you can yeah. do with more of those um Some people items. like to put the rod more on the top yeah facing up towards so the ceiling so that the flute is more stable it doesn't rock back as much uh like yeah experiment things like that yeah because so yeah personally i i'm not comfortable like that mm -hmm. so i i don't do that but it really works for some people yeah, so exactly of course if you do that then you'll have to change the angle of your of your head joint with the body of the flute mm -hmm. so that it's always the same angle for your mouth right exactly yeah. so you can look into that and, um, like I said, start with the baseline. It's all about, first of all, how you, how you feel comfortable on the flute. Like, you don't want to be forced by a teacher too much to something that you're uncomfortable with. So you have to say to them, I don't feel comfortable like this. I'm actually maybe getting pain. Can we try something else, you know, if you have a teacher? If not, you're doing it self, self-teaching. self Try things, you know, like, and do that and just... Um, find a, a way to, so you can be healthier yeah. uh, healthier playing look, uh, look at yourself in the mirror that can help or film yourself and then watch sometimes from an outside perspective it's easier exactly. than how we feel mm -hmm. uh, we don't always feel our body perfectly the exactly. way it really is yeah yeah <coughs> so be sure to leave one or two more questions we're going to answer one more maybe two more after that so if you have uh, any diehard questions let us know and then we'll be ending the show for this uh, month we do this at the last Sunday of every month and um, that's where you can talk to us live here on YouTube. It's pretty awesome. It's fun. We love our community. We love how everybody's uh, learning the, over the course of uh, their journeys. Um, I can't pronounce her name because it's in Korean or in Japanese. I'm not sure. I have a new beginner's flute, bought a few months ago, but it's already a bit tarnishing around the lip plate. 
I always clean it and put it away after I use it. How do I prevent it from tarnishing? Well, you can just... <laughs> the easiest one is not playing the flute because <laughs> tarnishing just happens because of condensation and because of the acidity between you and your your breath and your skin. And it's just a normal thing. It doesn't deteriorate the sound or anything like that. Some people put little pieces of... Not tape, but there's like flute lip plate tape that you can put on there that can prevent a little bit of that if it's really becoming an irritation for you. But it's purely cosmetic. There is a threshold, obviously, of a certain point. You probably want to have it clean professionally so that it's eventually uh, nice and sterling and nice yeah, and clean. Yeah, they, they bring it back to, a, to its beginning. To its factory uh, stage, yeah. yeah. So, My but, first flute yeah. teacher, he, his flute was almost all... Dark like I knew that. somebody like that too. And mm -hmm. he was saying, yeah, it's just because uh, I have more acidity on my skin and it does that. But yeah, it doesn't affect anything. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like some other metals don't do that. So say you had a gold flute. Gold doesn't tarnish as much for some players. So maybe your next flute, you could have <laughs> like a gold lip plate. Yeah, which if is it's very just recent, the lip, yeah. it's then true. it's not very expensive. And sometimes it's even gold plated lip plate. So right. It's just so that it doesn't do doesn't that. Doesn't do that, exactly. Yeah, because so. also sometimes I know it leaves a trace on your skin and you're like, oh, I have this black thing on my skin when I'm done. Like uh, this, like you look like you're... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it leaves exactly. a little thing of uh, grayish. Uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So hopefully that helps helps you uh, with that. Um, a -E, sorry, I can't pronounce it, but it's the A-I-E-I-E, -E, wants to know, are there any exercises for improving improvisation? Well, what I would start uh, by doing, I don't know what your level is. I'm not an imp a great improviser, but uh, I like showing my students uh, pentatonic scale. Pentatonic scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, let's say you do a major... I, I like minor pentatonic. So let's say uh, A, C, D, E, G mm -hmm. would be pentatonic, like penta, five. So you have five notes in your scale. If you Google that, you'll find... Uh, <laughs> but let, let's say you do an A minor pentatonic scale. You'll have A, C, D, E, G. And you only play with those notes. And don't try to do the scale going up and down and up and down. Choose like two, three notes. Make a, make a, um, Change rhythms on them and then make a little moti motif, you know, that you... And then go somewhere else. You know, don't go... Ta -na. Like you have to go and then go up and down, not always up and always down. You know, you know exactly, what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You can start with two notes and do cool rhythms on them and then add a third note and then, you know, have movements going up and down like when you're talking. You don't, we don't go. <laughs> that. Uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. 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 That's my my uh, advice yeah also <laughs> there's like a lot of cool like if you want to improvise over tunes like jazz tunes and stuff like that there are lots of software and lots of like like it's band in a box you can learn that that's a whole wormhole of stuff or you can go to tom play they even have jazz tracks that you can improvise over top tomplay.com they have most of the jazz stuff there's either two options playing it straight ahead with the music or playing it uh improvised so it just plays the back track and you follow along to the changes and you just play and doodle and, you know, doodling is also what a lot of people did. Also, maybe transcribe a solo that you really like from somebody and learn that solo and then learn how that solo worked and how they made the notes yeah. fit. Those are all different ways of learning improvisation. It's a good way too. to learn um, how they the made ways. it. You know, you kind of the structure. Um, you analyze it a little bit and then you, yeah. you're you like, oh, that's how this person does it. But yeah. Yeah. And I think even like maybe even Berkeley has sometimes a free improvisation course. Sometimes they offer free courses over on. They on have one on Coursera. Coursera. Coursera.org. There's an improvisation course yeah. there. Yeah. And it's yeah. for beginners, you know, it, it can really get you somewhere uh, if you know a little bit already about flute and the fingering. You have to so. know a little bit because he talks about, I, I watched a little bit of the beginning. Oh, that's cool. He, he talks about like the different. Um, different modes okay. like dorian and Eolian yeah, and all yeah, those yeah. things and then when to use them on which chords you use what and so like yeah it's pretty good uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. you can look at that yeah uh peter nelson here says uh hopefully i answered your question 
we'll try to do some videos a little bit of basic improvisation that could be fun to do a nice video about that as well something fun for people to doodle with peter one peter says just love the video starting my journey once my teacher decides not to reschedule me for a third time it happens you know rescheduling is always a, a real thing played piano for 23 years need a smaller instrument to play because i don't have enough room oh yeah that happens. Flute is perfect yeah flute <laughs> is the most perfect instrument it's basically can, pocketable <laughs> and you can bring it everywhere yep and you travel, cool. travel anything like, like yeah it's great yeah i know uh some people they do world the while you know they go world uh not touring but i mean like they go on big vacations and go all over backpacking backpacking is the word yeah, yeah. and they put their flute in there and they yeah. play with whoever's around and or play by themselves it's super fun it's pretty amazing uh, one last question I think we have here by Danny, I think. Um, as I climb the scale and get to those high notes, I find that I have to turn the lip plate inwards to stay in tune. Is that commonplace? Yeah. Yes and no. There's also a lot of people who do like lip attitude, so it's mainly a lot of lip movement to complement a little bit of uh, the turning because it's yeah, a yeah. lot of Yeah, I don't movement. think the turning is the best solution. Right. But it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's normal if you're... Um, the intonation hello 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 i think we are back we had a hey. technical problem internet went down that's a first for everything you know yeah, but Sorry someone about said that. again, so maybe it was on and off during the whole podcast. No, it was completely it? off because I turned it off. Don't okay. uh, that's uh, <laughs> something to discuss for later <laughs> during post. <laughs> no, no, but I'm just uh, reading. Here. Yeah, so we'll just kind of roll right back uh, to finish off the show. Um, but yeah, technical issues. Not anybody else. It was on our side of things. Sorry about that. Um, what do we got here? So we were saying that. Yes, it's normal that in the third octave you right. get a bit too exactly. uh, too sharp, and if you want to lower it, uh, turning your flute in is not the best way. There's other ways. We yeah. have a video about how to play in tune. I think that's how it's called, how to play in tune, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Uh, and I show different ways to change your intonation. That's a way, but it, it it does affect your sound. So you want to send the air a little bit lower on the on the lip plate. So that's kind of what you're doing by bringing it in, but. Um, I feel that making more space in the mouth and also bringing my jaw in a little bit um, helps, like more yeah, back. Exactly. Um, play with a tuner, but watch that video. You'll see there's there's different ways, but with the muscles of your face, it's usually more efficient than just turning because also it might affect your technique if you turn your flute in and out mm -hmm. while you're playing fast. That's right. So yeah, it can happen for sure. You yeah. want more stability than less, but if you if you're really sharp and you have to, I prefer turning my flute in a little bit than being way too sharp. Like, exactly. There's no dogma. You try to get no. a good result. That's, That's what right. you want. You want a good result. It's totally yeah. true. So yeah, everybody, thanks so much for sticking around even after the technical difficulties. This happens, uh, you know, very rarely. That was kind I of. I think it never something. happened before. I don't think it's never happened exactly. Mm. So yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything that you want us to answer for next month, let us know in the comments. Also, like I said, go and leave a five star review over at Apple Podcasts or over at uh, Spotify. But if you want to leave a comment so we can read it, go leave it at Apple Podcasts wherever you are in the world, and we'll uh, we'll. We'll read it out loud at the beginning of the show. Yes. And uh, thanks, everybody, for your patronage um, over at Patreon. And also, now on all the videos, you can give um, a super thanks, I think, or a super something. So you can actually donate money directly to a video. Any of our videos, you know, like you do super chat here in the chat. Uh, you can do that on any video we do now over on the Flute channel. So you can help us even more if a video was super helpful for you and you feel that you can uh, give a contribution to us, you know, as little as whatever you want. And uh, that goes directly to us. And that helps us out even immensely uh, more. And that's been happening a lot lately. So uh, we really uh, are thankful for that. Oh, yes. Thank you so, so yeah. much, so everyone. Thanks, everybody. What a great discussion. Um, come and join us again on the next last Sunday of June where we'll still be here. We won't be uh, out uh, touring yet, but we'll also do um, the podcast on tour as well. Those podcasts will keep going throughout the, the summer and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, leave a comment, like the video, uh, go and see some of our new videos. We just did a new video with Esther Abrami, the 
very, very talented Esther Abrami. She's a violinist who just signed, I think, with Sony Classical. We just did a video over on her channel, and we did a video over on our channel of uh, some pieces and stuff like that. We're going to have more collaborations uh, coming up in the next couple of months as well, too. And... Um, yeah, and new videos are going to come out. New videos going to come out this Thursday. I think it's going to be Canon Rock. We're going to put Canon Rock out. Oh, cool. We recorded that, and that's going to be pretty fun. And yeah, thanks everybody so much for uh, for taking the time to be with us here live. See you next time. See you. Bye. Bye.